So I am very excited today to um, kick off our Oncology Emergency Series. This is the first of three, taking a deeper dive into um, some of our oncologic emergencies. So um, Laura Blanchard is joining me today to talk about neutropenic fever, tumor lysis syndrome, and cord compression. So Laura, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, here is her bio and her top five. So Laura received her master's in physician assistant practice at Campbell University in 2013. She is a graduate of the charter class of Campbell University's physician assistant program, graduating as a member of the Pi Alpha National Honor Society. She also serves as adjunct faculty for Campbell University's PA program and recently received their Emerging Leader Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and since 2013, she has worked in the malignant hematology here at UNC Medical Center, where she currently serves as the lead inpatient malignant hematology APP. And then in 2019, Laura was named the Leukemia Lymphoma Society's Triangle Woman of the Year and has served on their executive leadership board since 2021. So thank you, Laura, for joining us. So outside of your professional bio, something, um, a, a hobby or personal you'd like to share with our audience? Sure. Um, I think it'd be fun to know that I actually was a, um, a professional trumpet player before I went to PA school and served as the principal trumpet player of our symphony back home. That's exciting. Yeah. Great. Thanks for Little sharing. Little did y'all know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should have brought the trumpet. You could have right? start, started on, us off with a show. Um, so our poll everywhere here is a sample of what um, it will look like. You will have an opportunity to try it in a moment. So pollev.com forward slash UNC LCN or backslash, sorry. Here are our disclosures. So um, you can test out our poll everywhere. What one word comes to mind when you hear the phrase oncologic emergencies? Scary might be one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Challenging. Well, That's that. a good one. Mm -hmm. Sepsis, yeah, it's great. Scary, yes, yes. We'll make it less scary. That's what Laura's going to train you all, so um, yes, we will be less scared. <laughs> Complex. Yeah. Yeah, I guess tumor lysis is a popular one. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so thank you. Um, so I will turn it over now to Laura. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, letting me join. Um, I'm very happy to be here and. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about oncological emergencies because this is a passion of mine. Um, I work on the inpatient setting, and so we see a lot of these. Um, and I think it's really helpful for providers who don't work on the inpatient, inpatient setting, but work in ERs, urgent cares, primary care, all of those places. Um, these different types of oncological emergencies can present to you. Um, so it's great to know what they look like, how to identify them, and kind of the best next steps. So as we've talked about, we're gonna take a little bit of a deeper dive into neutropenic fever, tumor lysis syndrome, and then cord compression. So to get started, what I wanted to talk about is all of the oncological emergencies in general and how they're broken down to help you kind of uh, figure out how to think about them. So uh, mechanical is the first one, and that's where the spinal cord compression falls under. Then you have metabolic, which is where your tumor lysis syndrome is going to fall. And then you have the hematologic, where um, your febrile neutropenia will fall. So throughout this um, presentation, there's a couple of cases. These are all real live cases that I admitted from our ER um, with all of their data um, and whatnot, but obviously no patient identifiers. And um, I think it's going to be really helpful to go through these cases and see real life um, events um, and how they turned out. 
So the first case we have is a 70-year-old male with a past medical history of chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and IgG kappa smoldering multivioloma, who presented to the ER with uncontrolled back pain, confusion, and weakness. The patient was seen in the infusion center one day prior and received IV, um, IV fluids and Zomata for an elevated calcium. And he also received um, an increase in his pain regimen. So while in the ER, we did a little bit of a workup. Um, you got a chemistry panel, and the only thing that's really of note is that his creatinine was elevated at 2.6, and his calcium was also elevated at 11.4. So you did a good physical exam. You saw some paraspinal tenderness over the L4, L5 um, bilaterally, but otherwise there was no focal neurological findings, um, no midline pain, no step off or um, otherwise um, any deformities. So it leads us to our first uh, poll everywhere question. Um, so the question is, which of the following diagnoses are you most concerned about? So um, poll everywhere is having some technical difficulties. So please, um, you can respond via the chat, and um, I will uh, monitor that and share your answers with Laura. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So some poll everywhere. If you're not able to input, I will just mention to put into the chat, and we will adjust. Sounds great. Yeah, so the question is, which of the following diagnoses are you most concerned about? So the um, responses would be hypercalcemia, or hypercalcemia, cord compression, altered mental status, or renal dysfunction. So we have an altered mental status, a renal dysfunction, Board compression, compression. Great. So um, a couple of y'all got the correct answer, and um, I'm going to explain a little bit why um, that is the correct answer. So obviously we're talking about um, oncological emergencies, and so cord compression here is going to be the correct answer. And that answer is because the patient's presenting with pain and weakness, and they have a diagnosis of cancer. So those three things together um, should be very high on your differential for cord compression. Yes, it is true they have um, hypercalcemia. Um, their calcium was a little bit elevated at 11.4, but they were treated in an infusion center the day prior for that. Um, they were given a medication and IV fluids, and that number is going to continue to downcrease um, after the Zometa dose. Altered mental status, yes, he had some altered mental status. We all know that altered mental status is something that um, can be from a very wide array of disorders. Um, he also had an increase in his pain medication. So in this case, that was likely the leading um, cause to his altered mental status. And then renal dysfunction, yes, it is true he has renal dysfunction, uh, but renal dysfunction is not going to cause pain and weakness. And so uh, while that is a part of what's going on, when we're putting his whole picture together, cord compression is the thing that we're most concerned about. So let's talk a little bit about what cord compression is. So the important thing to know about cord compression is this is actually a radiological diagnosis. So this is not something that you can uh, make a diagnosis just on the clinical presentation. You really need the radio radiologist and the imaging to confirm cord compression. So what you see on the image is you have compression of that um, fecal sac. And on your clinical presentation, you can have that with or without neurological symptoms. So it's really also important. You're not always going to have neurological symptoms with cord compression. So it should remain on your differential if somebody has cancer and has pain. So what is actually happening in cord compression? So this is where you have tumor invasion of the epidural space. And tumors really like to take the path of least resistance. And so it really starts to encircle the fecal sac. And as it begins to encircle um, that sac, the tumor begins to compress the spinal cord, and that's when edema begins to develop. So the more edema you have, the bigger the tumor gets, the more compressed that spine becomes, leading to more and more complications of the spinal cord compression. So when we think about locations, um, the thoracic spine is actually the um, most common place that we see it. It's about 65% of um, patients will present with um, the thoracic spine lesion. Then uh, lumbar function, func oh my gosh, then the lumbar and then the cervical uh, area. 
So when we think about what is the most common cancer type, um, so as you can see here, lung cancer is the most common at about 25%, followed by prostate, multiple myeloma, and breast cancer. And these are what you see in adults. And whenever you look at these solid tumors, so the lung cancer, the prostate, and the breast, these are also cancers that tend to um, metastasize to the bone. And as we know, the vertebral bodies are bones. Um, and so if they're going to metastasize to that vertebral body, they're going to um, get seated there um, from the arterial seating. And then the tumor develops and starts to encompass um, the spinal cord. With multiple myeloma, things are a little bit different. Um, multiple myeloma is a disease of the bone marrow, so it's already within the bone. And so uh, the vertebral bodies can actually um, become weak and have compression fractures. Those compression factors, uh, fractures can then lead to spinal cord compression. They also can present with something that's called a plasma cytoma, which is very similar to, um, to a solid tumor. It's just made of plasma cells. And so that, again, can also um, encircle the spinal canal and cause cord compression. So when we think about children, um, the diseases are a little bit different. So you would be thinking about um, cord compression in sarcoma patients, um, neuroblastomas, and then Hodgkin lymphoma. So like we just talked about, um, this all happens from arterial seeding of the bone in about 85 to 90% of the cases. Um, so that metastatic spread is the leading driver to this um, cord compression. So when we think about how are we gonna work this up, what is the best image? The best imaging modality to get is an MRI. Um, I'm sure most of us know that MRIs are gonna be much more detailed and uh, down to the tissue level. And so you really need that detail um, to be able to, to figure out how much compression is there, is the spinal cord involved, um, so on and so forth. You can use a CT scan if um, the patient is not able to get an MRI but is used as an alternative, not as the primary diagnostic modality. And another thing to remember, um, x-rays are not very helpful in this population because the amount of, um, or the level of tissues that you see on an x-ray is very minimal. So you're not really gonna be able to get a good sense of, is that compression there? Another thing to remember is early detection is key. So this is um, something that needs to stay high on your differential. Again, for a patient who has cancer and who has pain, um, that should always be something that you're concerned about. And getting the image um, via MRI is going to be extremely helpful um, to make sure that the, the patient is taken care of and prevent the symptoms from spreading. So the next question that we have um, is, so you're waiting on your MRI to confirm the diagnosis of spinal cord compression. Which of the following is the typical progression of symptoms for a patient with spinal cord compression? Should, you should be able to input your answers via poll everywhere. It looks like this um, particular question is behaving for us. So there we go. Thank you all. Ooh, 50-50. Is anybody going to break the tie? Great. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. This is great. All right, so most of you got the correct answer. The answer is B, which is pain, followed by sensory, followed by motor, and then followed by bowel and bladder dysfunction. So great job. All right, so as you can see here, these symptoms really are a continuum. So a patient can present to you at any point, um, but they will usually progress in this kind of stepwise fashion. So pain is the first one. And it's really also important to know that this pain is um, something that actually precedes any neurological symptom by about seven weeks. So again, I think I've said this twice already, patients with cancer who have back pain, it something that you should really keep in mind and keep on the top of your differential is cord compression. Um, also with the pain, the location of that pain is gonna be at the same level of the tumor, although you can have some referred pain, um, which kind of make your clinical exam um, a little difficult, but the pain should be located at that tumor. And then just like with almost every kind of pain and cancer, um, the pain is worse at night. So then as it progresses, um, it moves into the sensory dysfunction that usually presents with ascending numbness, and a very um, interesting fact is that the sensory changes can often um, be one to five levels below where the actual compression has happened. So it's being mindful of that on your physical exam um, as well. 
And then obviously, if the lesion was in your chondro equina, you would have a saddle anesthesia, and then you um, can begin to lose your reflexes. As you move through your motor dysfunction, that's when you begin to have the weakness, um, and that weakness will follow the nerve uh, pattern at the level of the tumor. Then as the weakness progresses, you're gonna also begin to have some gait dysfunction. And then the really late finding um, for these patients is bowel and bladder dysfunction. So most of the time when we think about bowel and bladder dysfunction, we think about the loss of or incontinence of urine, incontinence of stool. However, the most common finding that these patients actually have is urinary retention. Um, so just don't let urinary retention um, trip you up and be like, oh, that's not actual bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, that's actually the leading cause or the, the leading symptom that they'll have. So our next question is, you have now confirmed cord compression on your MRI. What is the best treatment for this patient? And for this question, you can um, put your answers in the chat. This poll everywhere is not behaving for us, so I want to keep you all on your toes. So um, <laughs> this one, if you could put your answers in the chat, I will keep an eye on them for Laura. So the answer um, would be IV steroids, consult neurosurgery, consult radiation oncology, or all of the above. We're getting all of the above seems to be the most popular. Wonderful job, guys. I'm very, very impressed. Yes, so all of the above is the correct answer. All right, so when we think about the treatment of cord compression, um, we wanna do all of these things kind of at the same time. So we'll talk about the, um, the hydrosteroids first because that's the thing that um, you can tend to get happen um, the fastest. So you're gonna give hydrosteroids immediately. Um, this is used as a bridge to any kind of definitive therapy. It also decreases the associated edema. Um, and so the patient can really begin to um, decompress um, whenever you start the steroids and that really helps to prevent those symptoms from progressing any further. There's also data that shows um, with steroids, increased probability of ambulation post-treatment. Um, so it's a very, very important thing to give upfront and give as soon as possible. So then you're also gonna consult um, neurosurgery and radiation oncology at the same time. Neurosurgery is helpful because they can determine if there's any kind of decompression that needs to happen. They help you determine if the, um, the spine is unstable and if there's any surgery that needs to happen for that. And then they're also really good about helping you figure out if interventional radiology would be helpful um, with doing kyphoplasty for pain control. Um, then whenever you talk to radiation oncology, they're gonna be able to give the radiation um, to those tumors that are sensitive to really start to shrink the tumor and again, bring off um, that compression. So what actually is happening behind the scenes is whenever you consult neurosurgery and you consult radiation, um, they actually talk to each other. They have a great relationship. Um, and so often they will come to you with their plan after have already talked um, talk to each other. And so there's also data that shows surgery plus radiation have better outcomes for post-treatment ambulation than just radiation alone. So it really, really is important to get neurosurgery involved and radiation oncology involved, and then they will uh, present the best steps um, after that. So when we think about outcomes in spinal cord compression, this is what a lot of patients are really concerned about. Um, so ambulation is obviously very important for the majority of our patients. And um, there's some statistics that show, um, based on your presentation, helps you determine whether or not the person's actually gonna be able to walk again. So for patients who present uh, being able to ambulate, about 75% of them are gonna be able to ambulate post-treatment. If they present with weakness, about 30 to 50% of them will be able to ambulate after treatment. And then if they pre uh, present with paralysis, only about 10% of them are gonna be able to ambulate after treatment. So this also really shows how important it is to make this diagnosis quickly, uh, begin steroid quickly, and make sure that you get your consults on board um, so that the treatment can um, happen for these patients. So I wanted to give a little bit of a res resolution um, how this patient turned out. So we ended up getting an MRI. It showed myeloma involvement of the L5 um, spine with a pathological fracture. The MRI did read it as a compression grade 1C, which means thecal sac um, deformation with nerve root contact. The patient was given dexamethasone 10 milligrams IV once, um, followed by four milligrams by mouth every six hours thereafter. We did consult neurosurgery and radiation oncology. 
neurosurgery um, said there was no emergent interventions, but they did recommend kyphoplasty for pain control. And when we spoke with radiation and oncology, um, they decided to proceed with treatment following the kyphoplasty. And the really good news is the patient was able to ambulate post-treatment. So the next case that we have is a 36-year-old male with past medical history of um, renal stones who presents with left flank pain times one week. He endorses some um, hematuria, easy bruising on his legs, and gum bleeding while he brushes his teeth, but denies any fevers or chills. So you're in your clinic and you um, do a little bit of initial workup. And on your CBC, you see a white count of 42.8, which is elevated, a hemoglobin of 14.8, and a platelets of 33, which is on the low side. And then you also have a smear um, that showed abnormal lymphoid cells. On your chemistry panel, you see that you have a potassium of 5.1, um, a creatinine of 2.9, which is a little odd in a 36-year-old male, and then a calcium of 9.9. .9. You went ahead and got a UA um, to roll out the hematuria. You saw some white blood cells. You obviously saw some blood, but it was otherwise unremarkable. And then you did a great exam and found that they have left-sided CVA tenderness. So the question here um, that I guess we'll put in the chat is, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Pyelonephritis, um, a UTI, tumor lysis syndrome, or renal stones? So we have C, tumor lysis syndrome. Got a couple for tumor lysis syndrome. Everybody's saying tumor, tumor lysis. lysis. Love it, love it, love it. So yes, tumor lysis is the correct answer here. Um, so pyelonephritis um, is something that you could consider, but pyelonephritis tends to have more systemic symptoms. They tend to have fevers, and you're also not going to have low platelets um, with that. Urinary tract infection, again, could it possibly be there? Yes, but your UA was otherwise pretty unremarkable. And then for renal stones, he has a history of it. It can cause hematuria, but it also is not going to cause the, um, the low platelet level. So looking at this case altogether, you have a patient with a high white count, low platelets, which is really concerning for cancer. And then you have some electrolyte abnormalities. And so tumor lysis syndrome is really um, the highest thing on your differential here. So let's talk a little bit about what tumor lysis syndrome is. So what's happening is you have very immature leukemia cells or just immature cancer cells in general. And as they're uh, being made and being pushed out into circulation, they're very fragile. And so that fragile cell wall gets broken very easily and they release their contents into the bloodstream. And um, that's where uh, the tumor lysis syndrome comes from. The body gets very overwhelmed by all of these electrolytes being released into the bloodstream. So um, this is something that can happen spontaneously, like we just talked about. The cells can just spontaneously die because they're so fragile and immature. Or it can happen after getting cytotoxic chemotherapy when we actually give them chemotherapy that kills the cells. Um, so both of those um, are ways that these electrolytes get released. So tumor lysis syndrome is actually a laboratory diagnosis. There's nothing clinical um, really about it. And here in this table, you're going to see the different type of electrolytes and things that we're looking for to make the diagnosis of tumor lysis syndrome. So you have to have at least two of these things um, to be able to make a diagnosis of tumor lysis. You could have all, but you need to have at least two of them. So the first lab is an LDH which is a marker of cell turnover or proliferation. So anything greater than 1,000 is concerning, and so that number is gonna be elevated. The next one is potassium. Um, we tend to um, be concerned about tumor lysis when that level is greater than six. So again, another elevated level. But it's also important to know that there are some people who just baseline may have a, um, a higher potassium, and so you really need to also see a 25% um, percent increase from their baseline. The same with uric acid. Um, the number that we tend to think about or be concerned about is eight. If you think about patients who have uric um, gout, um, their uric acid levels are likely gonna be a little bit elevated at baseline for them. So again, that 25% really comes into play for them. The next is phosphorus, um, anything greater than 4.5. 
and then calcium. So this is the one that stands out. So calcium is the only one that's going to be low. Everything else will be high. And the reason why that calcium is low is because it's binding to the phosphorus. So the higher your phosphorus level is, the lower your calcium level will be. All right, so in this case, you've ordered the appropriate tumor lysis labs to complete the workup, and this is what we found. We saw a potassium of 6.1, which is increased from what it previously was. His creatinine has also gotten worse at 3.9. His calcium has gotten lower at 8.6, and his phosphorus is increasing at 7.3. The uric acid is a new level, and it's 26.4, which is extremely high. And then you also have uh, an LDH level, which is elevated at 10,000. So our question is, what is your next step? Are you going to run and hide? Are you going to do a bone marrow biopsy, give IV fluids and correct the electrolytes, or do a PET scan? Nobody wants to run and hide? <laughs> For sure I thought I was at least going to get one of those, but that's okay. So it's good, and I'm glad nobody wants to run and hide because um, we're going to make you feel much more uh, comfortable with this disorder. But yes, the correct answer is IV fluids um, and correcting the electrolyte abnormalities. So when we think about tumor lysis syndrome, we really also need to think about what population should I be concerned about tumor lysis actually happening in. And so um, for our leukemia patients, um, patients with ALL, which is the lymphocytic leukemia, their white count tends to be greater than 100 before we see tumor lysis syndrome, versus those with AML, um, the white count, you tend to see it um, if it's greater than 50,000. The reason for that um, little bit of a difference is AML cells are a little bit bigger and a little bit more fragile, um, and so it doesn't take much um, for those cells to begin to die. Um, the next thing that we think about is a high tumor burden, and so this is something that you think about in disorders like Burkitt lymphoma or other high-grade lymphomas. Then also um, thinking about how proliferative their disease is, so how fast are these cells really turning over and how, um, how much cell death is going on. And that's where that LDH really um, plays a very large role, um, and again, like we talked about, greater than 1,000 um, is where you're concerned for this. And less frequently, you're going to see tumor lysis in solid tumors. It is possible, especially in metastatic tumors and really aggressive tumors. Um, but again, you're mostly going to see this on the malignant um, side or the malignant hematology side. Another population to keep in mind are people who have pre-existing renal disease or, or are set up for dehydration because these patients are likely already going to have some underlying renal disease. And as you overwhelm the body with all these electrolytes, um, it's going to overwhelm the kidneys, um, leading to poor outcomes. So when we think about monitoring, how much monitoring do we really need to do? And that's really based on how um, high risk the patient is. So we tend, if they're presenting at a high risk state, we start with Q6 hour monitoring of tumor lysis labs. And then we back down um, as those numbers improve or we increase if we're not um, being able to keep up with it appropriately. With solid tumors, um, they don't monitor them very um, frequently, but you can consider doing it at a baseline um, for any kind of aggressive um, form of solid tumor or if you have metastatic disease, kind of doing it prior to treatment to get a good baseline for them. So our goal in tumor lysis syndrome is really to prevent renal injury. A lot of our really poor outcomes from um, this disorder comes from those who end up on dialysis. And so what happens and why renal injury even occurs is because of the buildup of uric acid crystals and the deposit of phosphorus in the re renal tubules. And so prevention is very, very key um, in this disorder. And the way that we prevent it is by giving aggressive hydration. We call it hyperhydration. And we do that by giving saline um, at 150 to 200 nls per hour. Um, a thing to remember is we avoid lactated ringers. There is a little bit of potassium in lactated ringers. And if there is a patient who has a high potassium level, we don't want to be giving them any level of potassium um, for those patients. So we stick with saline and tumor lysis. Another drug that we give to kind of help prevent um, this renal injury is allopurinol. So allopurinol works by reducing uric, uric acid production, um, which helps to kind of um, prevent that uric acid from being made. Then we can also think about Cevelimar, um, that is a phosphate binder. And so if you have a high phosphorus um, level, you can give Cevelimar to help bring that number down. 
A drug that is kind of a, a plus or minus um, would be Raspiracase. We give that in really high risk patients. It is an expensive drug, but it works really, really well. It works by increasing the urine excretion of uric acid. So it works a little bit differently than allopurinol. So it's also very important to know that we should give both allopurinol and raspiracase together. Um, it's not a one or the other. You really want to use those together. So res raspiracase, what it does is um, at really high levels, it brings it almost all the way down to zero, whereas the allopurinol is preventing that number from ever going up. So it's not helpful if you bring that number all the way down to zero, but don't give the allopurinol because that number is just going to rise again. So it's really, really important to make sure that we have both of those um, in play. With the raspiracase, I just put a little bit of a caution here because um, it is an oxidizing drug. And so G6PD deficiencies um, is a concern when giving this medication um, for hemolysis. However, um, the risk of hemolysis is extremely low. Um, I believe it's less than 1% of the population would actually um, develop hemolysis if given the drug. But um, it is more important to protect this person's kidneys, and if they do develop hemolysis, treat that um, down the road. So you may ask, well, how long do I even need to be concerned about tumor lysis? So the risk actually decreases after about 72 hours of initiation of chemotherapy. So this is something, it's kind of a, a big hit. You're worried about it for that very short window up front, and then um, your risk really um, exponentially decreases after that. So how are we going to treat tumor lysis syndrome? So the answer is you treat whatever electrolyte abnormality is present. So if all of them are present, then you're going to treat all of them. If only one of them is present, you're just going to treat the one that's present. So with hyperkalemia, um, uh, that is going to be treated just like any other patient um, in any other scenario that has a high potassium. You can give K-exalate, calcium gluconate, um, insulin, or um, dialysis if needed. For hyperphosphatemia, you can give the Sevelomer, which is that phosphate binder, um, could also use dialysis. For hyperuricemia, we talked about um, allopurinol, raspiracase, and giving those together, but also this is um, an electrolyte that can be dialyzed off as well. So for your low calcium levels, um, we only treat if symptomatic. So the reason why we only treat if they're severely symptomatic is if you're going to give someone calcium and they already have a high phosphorus, it's just going to bind to the phosphate um, that's there. So you're not really getting a lot of benefit. Um, but if they are severely symptomatic, it's better to go ahead and treat them for that. So in summary, for this case, um, you ended up getting some flow cytometry that revealed a high-grade B-cell lymphoma. You had a CT of the abdomen that showed some retro retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. And then the patient was started on IV fluids at 200 ml per hour. He was given raspiracase three times. We typically only give it once, um, but he had a very high number, and it took three doses to bring it down. Then we started him on allopurinol 300 milligrams daily. Um, we typically at that um, uric acid level would have done BID, but because of his renal dysfunction, we did have to renally dose that. Then we gave Sevelomir around 2,400 uh, milligrams three times a day um, to, to see some improvement there. The patient did um, unfortunately end up on emergent dialysis for about four days um, due to his renal failure and all of the electrolyte abnormalities. He did get a lymph node biopsy, biopsy that revealed stage four Burkitt lymphoma. And for anybody who knows anything about Burkitt lymphoma, um, that is the kind of gold standard, gold star for um, diseases that present in tumor lysis syndrome. So the patient did receive their full treatment course. Um, he is now in remission and doing really, really well. So our next case um, is a 69-year-old male with past medical history of COPD, atrial fibrillation, type 2 diabetes, and AML on azacitidine and venetoclax, who presented to the ER with cough, shortness of breath, and some progressive altered mental status. Once he was in the ER, the patient was found to have a temperature of 39.1 degrees Celsius. So you got some labs, um, you saw his white cell count was low at 1.5, his ANC was also low at 0 0.1, his hemoglobin was low at 8.9, and his platelets were 24. On the chemistry panel, there wasn't much that was remarkable other than his CO2 was a little elevated at 34, but he does have a history of COPD. Um, and then on exam, he was in AFib um, and then was having some labored breathing and was using his CPAP um, at the time of your exam. 
So um, I think this is a question we'll put in the chat. Um, so the question is, what is your next step? Are you going to start empiric antibiotics? Are you going to order a chest x-ray? Are you going to start IV fluids? Or are you going to draw blood cultures? All right, we have D coming in so far of another one for blood cultures. Any more answers out there? Don't be shy. <laughs> Looks like blood cultures is the, the most popular. The winner. Great. Well, good job. So blood cultures is uh, the correct answer here. So um, this is really, really important um, to keep in mind that even though you are concerned for neutropenic fever and we want to start antibiotics, it is more important to draw your blood cultures first because... Neutropenic patients don't have an immune system. And so most of the time, any low level of um, organism is going to cause this fever response, but it may not be an overwhelming amount. And so if you were to give antibiotics first and then draw blood cultures, you've really decreased your chance of finding that, um, that source of that organism. So drawing blood cultures first and then immediately starting antibiotics is the appropriate path. So let's talk about what neutropenic fever is. So unfortunately, we have to go into what the specific definition is. And this is um, a definition from the IDSA guidelines, which is our infectious disease group. And it's based on the two different words in the title. So there's fever. So you have to have a fever. And that's defined as 38.3 once or 38.0 sustained over an hour. The second component to that word is neutropenic. And so that's where your ANC comes in. And so your ANC less than 500 or an anticipated drop to an ANC of less than 500 within 48 hours will get you kind of your definition of neutropenic um, fever. So when we think about risk factors, we think about the depth and the duration of neutropenia. So what does that mean? So the depth is how low that ANC gets. So you can have mild all the way to profound neutropenia. Profound neutropenia is um, a ANC less than, I think it's 0 0.1. And then mild neutropenia is um, an ANC of around 1.5. So there's a little bit of a continuum there. But the deeper the, um, the neutropenia or the lower the ANC, the more risk you are of developing neutropenic fever. Then we think about duration. So that's thinking about how long has this person been neutropenic? So we really um, increase our risk of neutropenic fevers when that duration of neutropenia is greater than seven days. Um, so the other thing to think about is sepsis is a real thing in our patients. Um, death occurs very quickly in our patients um, and can happen within the first four hours of fever. So it is extremely important um, if a cancer patient comes to you and has a fever that you you think about, is this a neutropenic fever, and do I need to go ahead and start that workup? So some of the sources that um, we think about with neutropenic fever, so you can have your, all of them, so bacterial, viral, or fungal, and it really can happen at any location. So some of the common sites that we see, um, the GI tract is a big one, the lungs, and then also the skin. But it's also important to not forget to examine some kind of key areas in patients. So sinuses are really important because you can have invasive fungal disease there. Um, your perianal region is also important uh, because people have hemorrhoids, they can have fissures, they can have other breakdown there. But it's also important to remember to avoid doing any digital rectal exams because you don't want to cause trauma and then lead to um, exposure to the bacteri uh, bacteria. Then you also want to look at their mucous membranes um, because that covers all the way from the mouth all the way down to the anus. And that is um, a good protective barrier for your body. And so if that's broken down, it helps you to, um, to think about, is that one of the sources that you have? So the population that's going to be most at risk uh, for neutropenic fever are going to be your induction chemotherapy patients for acute leukemia. And this is because they have the perfect storm. They have leukemia infiltration of their tissues that are going to break down their barriers. They're going to have granulocytes that aren't functioning properly or at a decreased level. And then they're also going to have that depth of a neutropenia for a very long time. So their ANC typically gets zero that lasts for about two to three weeks. So they really have almost every uh, barrier possible um, breakdown and therefore are at the highest risk for neutropenic fever. 
You can also see this in outpatients. Um, anybody receiving chemotherapy um, that is going to wipe out their immune system can present with a neutropenic fever. The reason why this is a little less common is because, again, you're just wiping out the marrow. Um, the depth and the duration is there, but they tend to also not be there for as long, and they also don't have the active um, leukemia going on in, uh, in their body. When we think about chronic neutropenia, um, these are syndromes like your MDS patients, your myelofibrosis, or your aplastic anemia. These also can present with neutropenic fever, but for these patients, um, the duration is there. They're also often neutropenic for several months to years, but their depth is not um, as deep as some of the other ones. So most of the time, their ANC tends to le live around maybe 1 to 0.7, um, but it's very rarely will they stay below um, that 0.1 threshold for a very long period of time. So all patients um, with an ANC less than 500 should be placed on prophylactic antimicrobials because this is the only way that our body um, is going to have any kind of protection against um, bacteria or uh, viral processes. And so it's really, really important to give them that protection while we wipe out their immune system. So let's talk a little bit about how neutropenic fever is going to present. So the most common um, presenting symptom is fever. And it's often that a fever is the only presenting symptom. So it's really, really important um, to know that these patients are not going to amount the same response that the general population will. The reason for that is they don't have the neutrophils. Um, so when we think about what makes up a abscess, what makes up a consolidation, those are all neutrophils. Our patients don't have neutrophils, and so they're not going to have that same response. So fever is usually the only presenting symptoms. Um, sometimes you can have other ones, but um, if you have a fever or a patient with fever and they have cancer, you need to really, really be thinking about neutropenic fever. Another um, thing to uh, consider is about 70% of the time, you're not going to find an, find an identified source. It means you're going to send blood cultures, you're going to do um, a CT scan, you're going to do sinuses um, scans, and nothing is going to come back with any reason to why they should be fevering. Um, it's very unfortunate. It's a little bit annoying, but it is what it is. And so that's why it's um, really, really important that we get those blood cultures early and we are very broad in our, um, our coverage. So when we think about workup, um, so very, very important. I can't uh, talk about this enough. Prior to antibiotics, we want to grab those blood cultures and we want to get two of them. So we want to get one peripheral and one central. If they don't have a central line, then you can get two peripherals. And the reason why we want two access points um, is because we want to roll out contamination. So um, urine cultures have been something that um, was recently removed from the IDCA guidelines, but it's something that some people still um, consider helpful. So you could do it, but most people are not going to um, order a urine culture unless they're symptomatic. Then after you've gotten the, um, the blood cultures done, you're going to go ahead and start your antibiotics. But you need to be thinking about what are some other um, things that I can be doing to find a source. So you can consider doing a CT chest. We do non-cons, um, especially if the person is stable enough to do that. But we also really only do that if they have respiratory symptoms. So if they don't have respiratory symptoms, that's not going to be the first thing that we go looking for. It's something we do if they have a sustained um, fever after starting antibiotics for about four days. We'll consider um, doing a CT scan to look for other um, etiologies. You also want to inspect the skin. Um, most of our patients are going to have central lines. Um, our patients often have central line site infections, so it's important to look at that. Um, and then also looking at other wounds or other ulcerations um, that the patient may have. Then based on any symptom that the patient um, presents with, you're going to do a fo focused physical exam to make sure that um, there's nothing there that can point you to your source. So we have another question. Um, you have collected your blood cultures and you're ready to start antibiotics. Which antibiotics would you choose to start for empiric coverage? We have... Via the chat. Okay, yes. via the chat. Um, so we have estreonam, mirapenem, cefepime, or vancomycin. We have C, cefepime looks like is the most popular so far. Perfect. Great. Well, I'm very impressed. That is a that is the answer. The answer is cefepime. So we'll talk a little bit about why the other ones are not appropriate. 
Um, so in our cancer patients, um, we want to have a very broad coverage. We want to have gram positive coverage, we want to have gram negative coverage, but our biggest killer in our patients are gram negative rods and pseudomonas. So cefepime covers all of those. So with Aztreonam, that is just a gram negative um, antibiotic, and so it has no coverage on the gram positive side. Mirapenem does, um, it's a very broad antibiotic, but because of how broad it is, it's even more broad than cefepime, we really wanna save those drugs for um, uh, bacteria that are resistant. And then with vancomycin, um, it is only gram positive coverage, and so then you're really missing that gram negative um, and pseudomodal coverage. So great job. All right, so um, talking about the treatment. So empiric antibiotics immediately, um, we tend to say within an hour, but ultimately if it's within four hours, we're relatively okay. So the, the mortality curve exponentially rises around four hours. So it's really, really important to, um, to get those antibiotics um, started as soon as possible. So the way that we dose our cefepime, we give it two grams every eight hours. Zosin is um, a medication that you can give as an alternative. We tend to not use it up front because there's a lot of patients who have um, renal issues. And so we really wanna give a medication that's a little bit easier on the kidneys and can be um, dose reduced for that. So then you have to consider, does your patient need vancomycin? And so um, the things that we think about for needing vancomycin is obviously MRSA. MRSA is the one thing that vancomycin is really good at. So if they have a history of MRSA, yes, you're going to go ahead and add vancomycin to your cefepime. Some other things to think about adding vancomycin for would be um, if they have a line infection, if they have skin breakdown, or if they have mucositis, or if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, because at that point, you really just want to make sure everything um, possible is covered. So you're going to give cefepime and vanc in those cases. Some other special considerations to think about, so VRE, um, daptomycin is the drug of choice that we use um, for ESBLs, um, you'll use your mirapenem. And then if you have a person who has penicillin allergies, meaning they can't take their cefepime, then you can think about giving astreonam and vancomycin to get that both gram negative and gram positive coverage. So some other special um, areas of consideration would be um, meningitis. So that is something that our patients can present with. They get a lot of frequent LPs, um, so that increases their risk of meningitis. So be mindful of that if they present with headaches or other meningitis type symptoms, it is possible for meningitis to be their source of neutropenic fever. The other one is pneumonia. We've talked a little bit about this. Um, most of the time when we think general populations, we know about viral pneumonias, we know about bacterial pneumonias, but fungal pneumonias are extremely common in our patients, um, especially because of how um, extended time they're um, neutropenic. And then you can also think about those atypical um, organisms as well. For the sinus infections, we talked a little bit about this, um, so that invasive fungal infections um, can happen, and so they tend to have um, sinus pressure in their nose, they can have headaches. And so if somebody presents with that, um, you may wanna get some sinus imaging just to get, um, figure out if there's any fungal infections going on. Teflitis is another um, disorder that some people present with, and this is called neutropenic intercolitis. Um, and that's when the GI tract um, actually gets inflamed. And as it's getting inflamed, it breaks down that barrier and you have translocation from the gut into your bloodstream. And that is treated, um, we do mirapenem or you can do cefepime plus flagell. So you really want to get that anaerobic coverage in there. And then for rectal fissures and periorectal abscesses, they can happen in our patients. They often just present with pain. Um, so they're not going to have that big abscess or um, other fluid collection there. It's usually just pain. And if they do, then you're going to want to get um, a CT scan to look for um, any kind of a fluid collection that you can't see externally. So how did this um, person um, do overall? So we ended up doing cefepime for 10 days. Um, we actually were not able to find an infectious source. Um, so he fits the status quo for our typical um, patient population, meaning his cultures and his CT chest were all negative for any reason to why he was having fevers. But he did become afebrile after starting antibiotics um, after 48 hours, which was great. So we knew that we were treating something um, and he was doing better. And then um, we gave him his 10-day course and discharged him on Leviquin prophylaxis because he was still neutropenic at that time to help to continue uh, to protect him. 
So these are my references, um, and I would be happy to uh, take on any questions. Thank you, Laura. That was really great and informative. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, so if you have any questions, please submit them through Poll Everywhere. We have um, a, a minute or two that we can pick Laura's brain. Um, so one thing that did come up in the beginning was when ordering an MRI, do you order your MRI with or without contrast when um, evaluating spinal cord compression? So we do it with contrast um, because you want to be able to see um, all of the, the tissue detail there. Um, if you're ever concerned, our radiology group is very, very friendly. Um, so feel free to call down to them and say, hey, I have this patient. This is what I'm concerned about. What should I do? Um, and they'll guide you in the, um, the best approach. Great. Yeah, I echo. Your radiologists are Fabulous. great resources. And the technicians. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the radiology technicians are great resources also. So thank you, Laura. Very thorough. I appreciate that. Any other questions? You know, I'll say you have my email, so if there's questions, feel free to, to email me, and I'm, I'm happy to, to help answer any questions. Um, and keep in mind, this was the first of a series to take a deeper dive into oncologic emergencies. So um, other colleagues will be joining us later in the year. Um, so make sure you keep an eye out for them um, to, to take a deeper dive into these um, some of these scary diagnoses. <laughs> but we'll make them less scary. That's right. Thank you, Laura. Awesome. Have a great day. So thank you everyone for joining us um, this afternoon. Thank you to the University Cancer Research Fund, to the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Cent uh, Center and the Cancer Network, to our amazing telehealth team that make all the magic happen, um, to Tim, Benny, John, Oliver, Andrew, Nadja, and Patrick. Thank you for your um, help and assistance.